good morning, good uh, good evening, uh, good night. I mean, to all people of the Icon S family uh, connected, and also people who wanted to attend this uh, this live event. We are very happy to welcome you uh, since we are going to discuss a seminal book by Ron Hirsch, City State. And uh, we have uh, I mean, uh, uh, people here to, to debate uh, on this book, uh, but I will leave the floor now to our moderator, Anna Piri Valentini, who will uh, introduce and present uh, the discussant uh, and uh, she will also moderate uh, the event. So welcome everybody and uh, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lorenzo. Welcome, everybody. This is the fourth ICONES live event that we have this year. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the two co-presidents of ICONES for giving me the opportunity to moderate this incredible panel. And I would also like to um, particularly thanks to Mariana Velasco Rivera, Fred Felix Gonzalez, and also uh, Sergio Verdugo, who really help us to uh, organize this panel. We are here today with uh, five incredible scholars that will comment Ron Hirsch's uh, last book that was published in 2020 from uh, by Oxford University Press. The book is titled, as you will always know, uh, City, State, Constitutionalism and the Mega City. I would like to ask you if you want, of course, to, um, to open your camera so that it seems a little bit more a uh, live event. Uh, this event is recorded. Um, the Q&A session won't be recorded, but the first part of the event uh, will be recorded. So of course, if you do not want to be uh, in the recording, you can um, turn your camera off. So before introducing the first uh, panelists, just some uh, uh, other practical information. Of course, uh, there will be um, space uh, for your question, you will be able to ask and address your comments and questions to the panelists, both uh, by using uh, the raise hand option, so addressing directly, uh, and you can also type your question in the chat. So I think I gave you all the practical information and we can start with the first panelist we have today. The first panelist is Menaka Guruswami. She is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India, and she has 10 minutes to give her comments. So please, the floor is yours, Menaka. Um, thank you so much, uh, Anna, um, and thank you so much for uh, to Icon S um, for organizing this panel um, and for really, you know, making it possible for me to um, read Rand Herschel's remarkable book, um, City State. Um, you know, um, what is extraordinary about Rand's work um, in comparative constitutional law um, is he's really a, an extraordinary trailblazer in him. This book is special uh, because it takes us beyond a conversation on method or beyond a conversation on um, juristocracy. It takes us to uh, the arena where most people uh, most people, especially in the global south, are living or will live um, in what Herschel calls the mega city. Um, now, just to give you context, uh, by 2030, um, according to Herschel, uh, mega cities of 50 million or even 100 million inhabitants are set to emerge. Uh, and to give you a sort of uh, a statistical context, in 1900, 12 cities in the world had more than a million residents. In 2018, 33 cities of the world um, had more than 10 million residents. Most of what we call the global south will live in these mega cities. I live in a mega city. I live and work in Delhi. Uh, the population of Delhi is 28 million. Um, now, Herschel's main argument, uh, and, and I believe an accurate one, is that contemporary constitutional thought and constitutional practice have failed to address one of the major challenges of modern governments, urban agglomeration and the rise of the mega city. And he's completely correct um, on this. Uh, as always, Herschel elegantly classifies what he's about to study. 
he classifies old world constitutionalism as emanating from the global north uh, and new world constitutionalism as emanating from the global south. And it is in the global south that he says that these metropolis, which, is, which are emerging in Asia, in Africa, in India, South Africa, Brazil, um, that these mega cities in which most people will live are in fact not provided for often constitutionally. By that we mean constitutional voice, by that we mean uh, sufficient electoral representation, by that you mean that the text, the practice, the jurisprudence of these constitutions neglect the urban mega city. Um, Herschel says in his work that three factors will facilitate constitutional innovation. One, the necessity factor, two, the constitutional factor, the amenability of the constitutional order, and three, the political factor. Now, for me, um, and I strongly encourage you, um, obviously, to read the book. For me, the most interesting aspects of the book um, are located um, in chapter three, constitutional innovation in governing the metropolis. Uh, and it really uses law, economics, and politics in a way that is refreshing to see in a comparative work, um, because that is really the utility of the comparative method, the ability to not only harness multidisciplines, move across jurisdictions, but locate them in statistics and economics, which is what makes this book remarkable to me. Um, now, I think the big point um, that Herschel makes um, when, when he's talking about, for instance, my city of, of Delhi, is that he makes two significant points. And these points are significant because it represents what is happening in mega cities in the global south. One, that despite it being a city of 28 million people, it is politically underrepresented. We have six members of parliament for 28 million people, uh, which is grossly underrepresented. We have Delhi, which is sort of uh, trifurcated. It's ruled partly by the federal government. It's ruled partly by the state government, which is an opposition party. And it's ruled partly by municipalities, which is a separate political party. And herein lies the problem. Herein lies the constitutional problem, herein lies a governance problem, and herein lies a politics problem. For instance, in this time of COVID, uh, as we live in, and um, you will all have perhaps heard that uh, India has, has now soon overtaken the United States uh, in terms of the number of people who've been uh, affected by the virus and the number of people who are dying every day from the virus. And it becomes incredibly important. Herschel's work is something to think about because a big piece of the litigation that is pending before the Supreme Court is actually that on vaccines and political power and urban governance. How does a city, a city state, a mega city like Delhi get access to enough vaccines? Vaccinations typically all over the world at this present moment are shaped by federal governments. Federal governments acquire vaccines, federal governments pay for vaccines, federal governments disseminate vaccines. At best, state governments and municipalities all over, including in America, at best have administered those vaccines. This is not the case in Delhi. The key federalism or cooperative federalism issue right now that I'm litigating before the Supreme Court is that health is, a, is in the legislative domain of both the federal and the state government. A constitution provides this textually. Fiscally, it is the central or federal government that has the resources to pay for vaccines. Uh, the state is only supposed to administer it. The federal government in India for the first time, and it's the first major constitutional democracy which has decided that state governments will buy vaccines for themselves um, as they will inoculate people below the age of 45 and above the age of 45, the federal government will. This has now become a constitutional issue because is it uh, the state government's legislative domain and governance role to you know, provide for healthcare and therefore vaccinations? Or is it the central government's constitutional role uh, to deal with pandemics um, and, and utilize the Epidemic Diseases Act? So this is in fact the case that we're litigating um, in the previous week, uh, but unfortunately one of the, you know, one of the senior judges, the presiding judges himself is unwell. 
um, and so the cases uh, differed. But therefore, it is in this world and, and, and something that I'm thinking of at this present moment that I find Herschel's work particularly interesting because he deals with these constitutional nuances even when it comes to the city that I live in. Um, and that is where I've always appreciated Rand's work, that his scholarship is located not just in facts. His scholarship is not just located in the real world that we live in of sociology, meeting politics, meeting economic um, um, uh, uh, conversations, but he is able to use a comparative method to kind of illuminate the challenges that are posed in these mega cities, but also the similarities and differences in constitutional orders and are some orders more amenable to appreciating um, the requirements of a mega city and are some orders just not able to do so. Uh, I particularly liked, I, I really love reading about uh, the constitutional space that Seoul has, that Hong Kong has, that the you know, urban center that, that Tokyo has. One, because it's just stuff that I hadn't thought about in terms of numbers, though, you know, Vicky knows this. The last time we met, we were in Seoul um, for the World Constitutional um, um, uh, Conference, and you could feel the power and, and, and the scale of Seoul, which is not just South Korea's biggest mega city, but is also where over half the population of South Korea lives in. And what are the constitutional conundrums that are posed by such a reality. Um, you know, you can read Rand's book and you will come away learning more about cities all over the world. You can read Rand's book and you will come away learning more about the real, the potential of the comparative method. Or you can really just read Rand, Rand's book if you're interested in the world at large, in the urban world at large. Here is a book which is good for a lawyer, is good for a scholar, is good for a stats person, um, and is also just good for economists and those who are in, interested in understanding um, the world around them. So thank you, Ram. I really enjoyed your book uh, and I look forward to the conversation ahead. Thank you very much, Nanaka, for your comments. And we, we could start uh, seeing by her comments the importance also of the comparison, the comparison and the comparative approach of these uh, books and the importance also of statistics and economic data that we have in this book. So we can uh, go to our um, second panelist. She is Bianca Tavolari, and she is professor of administrative law at the INSPER Institute of Education and Research in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So please, Bianca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for ICONAS for organizing this panel. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here, to listen to you and to be able to engage with Rand's uh, uh, last book. It is not the first time that we are uh, uh, talking about his book. We had an ICONAS Brazil panel on, on his book with, with Brazilian scholars and I was also able to participate. So it's a really a great pleasure to be here again. And also I also have, uh, I think of uh, uh, an advantage vantage point because I had the pleasure also to interview Ren on his book for uh, a Brazilian journal that's called 451, uh, in which I have a session that it's called The City and the Things. In Portuguese, it's better sounding than that, but it's inspired in, in Foucault, so the order and the thing. So we are, we are uh, discussing books on, on urban uh, studies and also, since I'm coming from, from the legal um, uh, tradition, from the legal field, it's also a great pleasure to to uh, build this bridge between these two different worlds. So it's also great to talk right after uh, Menaka because I'm also living in a mega city in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And um, unfortunately, similarly to India, Brazil is also uh, in the hotspot from COVID. So we're also dealing with similar issues, just like in India, uh, about federalism and how uh, federal governments are uh, being held accountable and responsible for, for a series of, of deaths and of neglect 
uh, facing uh, COVID measures. So I think this, this unites us uh, in our um, uh, comments here. But I would like, uh, before I start my, my questions and comments, I would like to say that um, Rand's book is a really important book. I think it's a game changer. Uh, we are talking here about, um, he's diagnosing a very specific void, a deliberate silence in theory and constitutional practices on urban studies, on cities, on mega cities. And this is um, something that he's trying to, to address, but also trying to explain. So why did we uh, neglect um, mega cities for so long in uh, several constitutions and also in constitutional theory and practice? And Brazil, it's kind of one of the big exceptions of the book because we have a federal constitution from 1988 that addresses uh, cities and municipalities as autonomous entities in our federalism. So it's um, also really uh, interesting to, to see how Brazil uh, uh, is portrayed in this bigger picture. So um, I think it's really important because it also uh, makes a bridge between urban studies and law in general, not only constitutional law. Because when we are talking about urban studies, we say it's a very interdisciplinary approach. And when you name the disciplines, law is never there because uh, we are, one thing that I can see from, from Brazil, from our Brazilian discussion, is that for a very long time, um, uh, urban law or even uh, municipal law was um, something that urban scholars were dealing with and did not have an inter, uh, a dialogue, a direct dialogue uh, in legal theory and sociology of law and constitutional law. So uh, we are kind of uh, um, uh, trying to catch up with uh, urban scholars that had to face urban legislation and very intrig uh, uh, intriguing and complex questions regarding, regarding law. So I think it's a very important book. I think we will be, be discussing your book for a very long time. So, one of the things that my main question addresses um, uh, our COVID situation, but also one of your main points of the book, and also it has to do with one of the questions that I, I, I posed to you in, in the interviews. It's uh, unfortunately only in Portuguese, this very um, uh, not uh, accessible language all over the world, but if you want, I, I can post the link over here. But one thing that um, I think it's, um, central to, to uh, your reasoning and your argument in the book is that cities are kind of intrinsically uh, progressive. So you are talking about how cities are super diverse, how cities are uh, inherently democratic, how we can see in a several cases like sanctuary cities, but also uh, in the Brad Brexit discussion, how you have a urban rural divide in which you have uh, the higher density associated to mega cities, making it um, um, more diverse, more plural, more democratic. And also, it is also one point that helps you explain why this was not uh, addressed in constitutional theory and practice, because you say cities are a threat because cities are explosive. They are the sites of protest. They are the sites of rebellion. So one of the reasons you name in order uh, uh, for, for us to understand why we didn't have a, a constitutional recognition of mega cities is because they pose a threat to, to state centrism. So one of your main, um, a paradigms uh, for, for the book. And what I think, uh, which is maybe uh, for someone who's looking uh, from a Brazilian uh, standpoint, that bothers me a little bit. And I ask you that, and you also refer to Richard Florida, the intrinsic uh, values of cities, and also to, to uh, a Greek tradition in which democracy was built on cities. But I think that you don't need that. You don't need uh, to put an essence on the cities in order for your argument to be solid and bold, because I think it um, um, it doesn't help you in one in one specific sense. Because what happens if mega cities are not that? What happens if we have a local government that is anti-democratic? illiberal or uh, not uh, 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 fighting for um, diversity and inclusive uh, public policies? How would we control that? If we assume that there is an intrinsic value to that, we um, might have one, a blind spot because we are not looking for co uh, constitutional control mechanism in order to um, address uh, uh, undemocratic mega cities. And also we are, um, uh, we are, 
trying to, we, we are uh, probably not seeing one specific uh, uh, point here, which is um, there may be an, in, an important interplay uh, between, between other uh, uh, federal entities, which I very much, uh, this is very much covered. It's not like you're saying state doesn't, uh, uh, um, it's not significant anymore. You're saying simply that there is a, like an, urban underrepresentation constitutions, which I totally, I totally agree. But I think that you can make your point without saying there is an essence because what's happening right now here in Brazil, and I think it's uh, similar, but somewhat different to, uh, I don't know, the, the Indian uh, uh, case so well, Menaka is probably pretty much aware of that and can uh, an expert can talk to us about it. But what's happening here in Brazil is our Supreme Court has decided that states and municipalities are able uh, to uh, search for vaccines and to implement uh, health policies uh, um, despite the federal government. And this is also very uh, new to our federalism, in which I think that you are perfectly right in which you say we have to rethink federalism. But what is going on here in Brazil through that? Our president, Jair Bolsonaro, is saying that the court said that the only accountability and the only responsibility for, for COVID measures are due to municipalities and states. So he's saying, I don't have to be accountable for that. I may be, I don't have to do anything because the Supreme Court said that municipalities and states are the only, not the only, but uh, the ones uh, that are able to do that in an undecentralized manner. So, uh, and we have a lot of examples of cities, of mega cities that are not, um, progressive at all, or that are uh, even Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a site of, of a lot of rebellion, but if you uh, look at a municipal administrations or even this is um, a, something that is kind of um, uh, marginal or even um, um, part of the history of resistance. So how, how could we uh, uh, put an exact measure of what is progressive? What I'm saying is it's, it's a trap. We don't have to go there. The, 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 the argument holds itself without that. So I think that um, we should have an urban representation in constitutional uh, theory and practice and in constitutions, despite saying that they, they are super diverse in essence and et cetera. But we also have, I think, that to think about a mechanism of control. So we should think that what happens when cities are, un mega cities are undemocratic or have undemocratic governments. Um, so this is my main point. I would also like to hear a little bit uh, more from you because you did not address one question that I think that would be interesting to hear. I, I don't have a clear point about that, but what about um, municipal or urban courts? Are they a part of your scheme or are they out of there? Because we are thinking mainly about legislative and uh, constitutional recognition, but what about courts? Do they, should they also be represented in a municipal level or not? Here in Brazil, we don't have that, for instance. I don't know how, how this, this uh, functions in other countries. So um, probably we're giving a very, uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, difficult questions for Rand that should have like uh, two hours to answer to all of them, but he will <laughs> he'll have probably 10 minutes. So, so I'll stop here and thank you again very much for being able to discuss about this book. I think it's really important. And for us uh, uh, here in Brazil, it's very uh, interesting to see how you uh, are uh, filling this void and also uh, calling attention to the importance of representing uh, urban densities in constitutional uh, legal theory and practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bianca. And like with this second intervention, we could focus a little bit on other, other aspects that were highlighted in Ron Hirsch's book. And so the characteristics of that sometimes and many times cities have in terms of democracy and progress. And I think we will be able to further discuss these issues later. So we can uh, go with our third panelist. She is Vicky Jackson, and she is professor of constitutional law at Harvard Law School in the United States. So uh, Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Icon S, for organizing it. Thank you, Ron, for this wonderful book. It is completely brilliant. It is learned. It is sweeping in scope. Uh, I'm really quite in awe of it. Um, uh, and I approach commenting on it with a great sense of humility, because although I know something about US cities, uh, 
what I know about the mega cities in the world and in the global south, I've learned from Ron's book, and I welcome the chance to learn from my distinguished co-panelists and from the audience when we get there. Uh, in my 10 minutes, I hope to develop um, three points uh, largely taking off from uh, his closing chapter, which are sort of thoughts for the future, wh where to go from all of this. Uh, first uh, point is I wanna express support and appreciation for his arguments in favor of a subsidiarity approach involving constitutional dev devolution or delegation of powers to cities. Uh, the disenfranchisement of city dwellers through unequal representation in the legislatures of the larger territories of which they are part is completely unjustified. It occurs in many places. Uh, and the principle of subsidiarity, moreover, should be taken seriously, I want to suggest, across all levels of government, which might take us down to city neighborhoods. Uh, what's the benefit of allocating power to the smallest, closest to the people, entity capable of competently exercising it? Uh, it enables more democratic participation. It enables more government responsiveness and it enables more competent government, assuming we have gotten the allocation level for competent handling of problems um, correct. Uh, it thereby helps link democracy and self participation to public welfare. Now, um, in the US, there is a small and interesting literature on the constitutional status um, of cities, uh, uh, although it's, it's small, I wanna say. Uh, the absence of comparative attention to this subject, having read Ron's book now seems to me impossible. And I'm sure as one of my co-panelists said, his book will be a game changer on this. I wanna briefly mention a new paper about to come out next month by Nicholas Bowie, Bowie a colleague of mine, who argues in the US context that the First Amendment that's in our constitution, uh, provision for the right of the people peaceably to assemble, which has been treated by the court as simply duplicating freedoms of speech, actually was about protecting the rights of elected assemblies to enact laws. And I think at least in the US uh, domain and hopefully others, the combined effect of Ron's brilliant comparative book and Nico's uh, new article will bring more focus to this problem. Last July of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, the governor of the Southern state of Georgia in the United States sued the mayor of the city of Atlanta, capital city of the state, the, the most important city of the state, to prevent the mayor from requiring face masks and social distancing. This is an example of the pernicious allocations of authority that Ron has described. Uh, the governor and the mayor negotiated and the suit was withdrawn uh, a month or so uh, later. I, I very much hope that Ron's work does have the game changer effect that we talked about. Now, um, taking devolution and subsidiarity seriously will require many questions to be addressed in the concrete practical work of uh, sorting this out uh, because there are many different models uh, that could be used and there are the complexities that arise from uh, at least from several features. Uh, one of them was mentioned by Bianca which is you might have very illiberal policies develop in some cities. In the United States, cities were really bad actors in the first 60 years of the 20th century on issues of race, uh, promoting exclusionary zoning, pushing poor people and people of color into particular areas. And there are ways of, of managing allocations of authority that might have a civil rights check at another level. Um, determining jurisdictional lines will obviously be a huge challenge. At times the work focuses on cities, at times it focuses on sort of the metropolitan areas around cities and the political economy of figuring out how to draw the lines, even if you know what lines are gonna give you the most competent government are huge um, challenges. There are issues about how to devolve competencies. And we heard, heard already from both uh, Bianca and, and Menica about the uh, challenges that can arise when there, are, when there is concurrent jurisdiction between multiple levels of government. Uh, but there's not only the choice between concurrent and uh, exclusive, there are new choices that we've learned about, uh, for example, in the 
German federalism model where the central government has jurisdiction over certain issues, but the lender can opt out if they want to, and then the federal government can overrule them. And it's a back and forth dialogue. So do you want to have categorical competencies or do you want to have a more dialogical consultative process amidst the various uh, jurisdictions? Now, a second reason that uh, I think this is complicated uh, is that city policies may impose externalities on those outside of cities. And that will be important in figuring out, well, what are the allocations of authority among the existing uh, levels? If one final challenge I'll mention in this part of my talk is, if there are areas of concurrent jurisdiction, and as a practical matter, I think there, there will be, one needs to think about what are the rules of prioritization. A big debate in the United States is whether higher level law, either state or federal, sets a floor that municipalities can go above, can have a higher minimum wage, for example, or sets both a floor and a ceiling. And it, so that will be another kind of a choice. And I fully expect, Ron, your brilliant book will be very generative of thinking about these and other questions about how to concretize this idea of devolving powers. Now, my second point is really, um, it's a set of questions coming out of my larger scale appre complete appreciation and agreement with Ron's emphasis on the need to correct the representation of cities. Back in the 1960s, not to say I'm picking on Georgia, again, I'm back to the state of Georgia. In the 1960s, one of the Supreme Court of the United States' leading cases on the one person, one vote rule came out of the state of Georgia, where Fulton County, where the city of Atlanta existed, had dramatically lower representation than the rural areas of the state. The Supreme Court said, no, 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 you can't do that. But as Ron has shown, there are sophisticated methods in place in many areas that have continued to result in the underrepresentation of cities. And this absolutely has to be uh, redressed, both underrepresentation and gerrymandering representation that has that effect. And he offers a number of creative ideas for how to do this. But there was one place and really only one place in the book where my eyebrows went up when I read it. I thought, really? And I, I read it again. And this was where Ron suggested that people who live in very densely populated urban areas should get extra representation as a way, uh, as a means of trying to redress the many, many harms that we have learned from Ron uh, exist from living under those circumstances. And this caused me to wonder, and it caused me to wonder, well, how do we compare the conceitedly dreadful circumstances in which very poor people living in the most dense areas of some of these mega cities live in? How do we compare their situation to people living in dire rural poverty. I thought, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe people think that rural poverty just isn't as bad as urban poverty. But, and I am absolutely not an expert and would love to learn more, but it looks to me like that isn't so. So I tried to do a little bit of reading and you know, found a recent study in India comparing life expectancies for the lowest quartile, economically lowest quartile, of urban dwellers and rural dwellers. Life expectancy for the rural dwellers in that lowest quartile was significantly lower than for the lowest quartile of the urban dwellers. If you look at another thing I care about, illiteracy gaps between men and women uh, in the rural areas, that's a much greater gap than otherwise. Uh, and there are some, you know, I've read some IMF and World Bank things that say that the most extreme poverty in at least some of the countries studied has been disproportionately rural. So I think I'm a rural rights activist and Ron comes in and says, let's give these sweaty dwellers extra representation. And I think, huh, well, why should I agree to that? So even if one could make the argument, are there going to be resentment costs that in terms of the overall goals of justice and equity are not going to be worth pursuing? If there's the political will to adopt such a proposal at any given moment, 
Could it be better used on things like reconfiguring the districts or allocation of powers? Um, that would be another kind of um, a question that I would ask. So that's my second point. And my third point is much, uh, it, it's really not a point, I think, Ron. I think it's a question uh, that I'd like to love to hear you on. And the third point is, is just this, and I, I, I don't think uh, Ron would disagree. It goes like this. So, when you read this book, you see that there are some what I would call normative priors, which I share about equality, about the evils of dramatic economic inequality, about the evils of harm to the environment, which are not only threaten the life and safety of presently living people, but of future generations. And I want to say that institutional design can only go so far. There's an ideational component to this of developing the spirit of what I would call solidarity, which would have to be the basis on which both efforts to redress economic inequality and efforts to redress harm to the climate rest. And that's a task that goes beyond the task of design, I think. And I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Vicky, for uh, your comments in which we could really uh, focus on two main topics of constitutional law, such as devolution and subsidiarity, and which are like central in Heer's book. Uh, we can go now uh, on with our um, fourth panelist. She is Mar Marge de Visser, Associate Professor of Law at the School of Law and of the Singapore Management University. So Marge, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much for organizing this, for inviting me to join, and I think most of all to Ren. Um, I, I should start by echoing what the others have said. Ren, I think in the book, what you ultimately try to do is to expand our collective constitutional imagination. And that's not something that you do. You excel in it. You, you, I, after I read the book, I found myself just wandering over it for days after I, I finished it, finding connections while doing a lot of my other reading, both academic and non-academic. So I think here to come back to a term that was mentioned earlier, in terms of a game changer, I think that's absolutely true. Now, also here to say something perhaps about um, what I, one of the things I liked most about the book. Now, we know that um, there are many references to Rand's earlier book about methodology. And to the extent that anyone has wondered, well, how exactly then should one conduct a proper comparative constitutional study that is interdisciplinary and that does everything that Ren, you know, has his massive checklist, this seems to be it. So I think that what you've done is you sort of created exhibit A for your previous book. Um, good luck to you for whatever book comes next. I don't think this is your last one. I hope it was your latest. Now, if we then, um, if you want, move on to my comment, and this hopefully goes to show something about all the, you know, the riches in the book. I was initially asked to go first, and I prepared my comments accordingly. And then Mariana asked me about 15 minutes before we started. Well, actually, because Manaka has to leave and she's got important constitutional litigation going on in India, could you swap? So he said, sure. This can be done, I think. Let me try and change my comments. And so I've no idea how this is going to pan out, but the fact that it's possible, I think, to come up with comments that haven't yet been raised should to all the readers suggest that there is a lot in the book. Now, what I hope to do is two things. One is to push Ren a little bit on one of the key concepts that he uses. And then the second, and I feel this duty is sort of incumbent upon me coming from the old Europe, which does not get good press in the book, to try and give a somewhat more positive narrative. Okay, so the first is this. Now, what the book does in chapters one through four is basically offer this dazzling discussion of city, you know, power, or more often lack of city power across time and space. And that functions as this crescendo for the fifth chapter, where, as Vicky mentioned, Ren builds this case, the argument, to strengthen the status of cities. And, and there are about, yeah, there's a number of urban specific arguments in there. But even after reading all of that, 
I was not entirely clear what we mean by an enhanced constitutional status. And that's because at times the book talks about empowerment and at other times references me to emancipation. And I think these two are not necessarily referring to the same thing. So let me try and elaborate a bit. Now, Wren very rightly criticizes the lack of resources that uh, many city cities face, as well as problems of political underrepresentation, particularly in these first past the post systems or situations where the constitution entrenches malapportionment. Now, if we want to address that, then that could conceivably be done by having a recognition of urban self-government in the constitution, alongside an explicit requirement to make adequate resources available. And that's very much what happens in South Africa, as Ren rightly notes. Now, we could also, if we care about democracy, uh, change the electoral system, um, prescribe an urban democratic principle. Now, if we engage in this type of empowerment, that clearly is important. It will change things. But ultimately, I don't think that it either requires or results in a change in the hierarchical conception of the state. It's saying we prop up the lower tier, but the cities would still be seen as part of the lower, the lower tier. And I'm not entirely sure that that is something that Ren would ultimately be very comfortable with. So that brings me to the notion of emancipation. And emancipation is typically understood as resisting or challenging existing power structures. And that seems at times more in line with Ren's critique of um, this state-centered perception of legal spatiality, where he said, we need to break away from the nation state paradigm. So what he, for instance, argues is that cities currently are forced to adopt national visions of the public good. And they should instead be able to address socioeconomic challenges more freely, creatively, aggressively. Cities might perhaps have leeway to fashion their own localized interpretation of fundamental rights. But that to me seems very different from capacity building or getting a seat at the national table, which is more linked to empowerment. Now here, I, I have some concerns about emancipation. And in part, they relate to something that Bianca mentioned, which is that how confident can we be that cities will do the right thing? Will city dwellers elect progressive and enlightened leaders? And even if they do, will the city administration, even if it's able to raise its own taxes and to be self-funded, truly resist private business pressure they might want to augment available capital. They might want to engage with businesses for reputational gains. Now then, and that brings me to something that Vicky just mentioned, from a constitutional design perspective, we would still have a need, I think, for some degree of oversight or stipulate minimum guarantees of democracy or rights or fiscal management, because we shouldn't want unfettered city autonomy. But if we do that, we're likely to reintroduce hierarchical tendencies and the potential for conflict. And here we can look at what has happened in the European Union. There we've had discussions of constitutional pluralism, multi-level governance, all inspired by this idea to move beyond hierarchy, and it doesn't happen. And part of the reason that it doesn't happen, and I think it can't happen, is because the different spheres of governance so here it would be city and let's say state or nation. They're not entirely distinct. They interlink, they overlap. So you will still get that question, who has competence, competence? So that's if you want that, that that's, that's my question, my main question to Rand. What kind of status improvement are we looking for? Now, let me then say something, you know, almost to vindicate Europe um, and I'm not going to talk about the nation state. I think that there is not too much you know, creativity going on there, especially when positioned vis-a-vis -vis the global south. I want to talk about the EU. And the reason is this. Now, Ren has one of the chapters in the book, chapter four, where he talks about city self-emancipation and informal networks. And he says, well, these 
you know, can make a difference and we see them on sustainability, environment and rights. But at the end of the day, the actual constitutional bite is limited. And the reason is that these kind of initiatives exist alongside the official legal structures and not within it. And I think here it can be interesting to look at the EU. So that would also be my pitch. This book should be read not just by constitutional lawyers, political scientists, etc. EU scholars, international scholars, they need to take note. The reason is this. If you look at the EU, then I think a number of the initiatives and the ideas that Rand suggests can be found there, albeit in embryonic form. For instance, subsidiarity. The EU treaties recognized as the constitutional charter of the EU, not only enshrined subsidiarity, but since the Treaty of Lisbon, explicitly mention the local level. Then we have the existence of the Committee of the Regions. That is an institution that needs to be consulted in EU policymaking that is meant to give a voice to local governance levels. Now, what is perhaps most interesting here is a recent development in 2016. That is when the EU adopted its urban agenda. Now, it's interesting for two reasons. One is that the urban agenda makes available to cities financial grants that they can apply for to experiment with creative solutions to urban challenges. And it engages cities early on to give their input on policies with an urban dimension. But second, the urban agenda has largely come about as a result of networking efforts among cities. And not only have these cities pushed for an urban agenda, they've also said in accepting the agenda, the conceptualization of a relationship between the EU and cities as vertical needs to be replaced by interdependence. And that is what the urban agenda does. So what I think the EU example might show us is how non-state actors, networks in partnership with, we can call it the transnational sphere, might help empower cities so that they can in a way leapfrog the nation state. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Marge, and like also for your suggestion to you and international scholars to take Ron Kier's book as, uh, as, um, as a very important piece of scholar. So we have our fifth panelist now, Lorenzo Cassini. He's a professor of administrative law at IMT School for Advanced Studies, Luca. And Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Grazie, Anna. So I'm very happy to, to have the, ch the chance again to, to comment on Rand's uh, book. Uh, this book is, uh, as many of you have already underlined, uh, uh, brilliant, it's a seminal, and uh, I think it really embodies the idea of a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, beside the uh, clear attempt of, by, by RAN of uh, connecting uh, uh, cities and constitutional law and in the, also highlighting the lack of constitutional legal scholarship in dealing uh, with cities, uh, uh, there is plenty of uh, uh, inputs and issues uh, affecting uh, all public law and not only law, political science and uh, statistics, uh, data. It's uh, a gold mine and uh, it's a must read book, uh, at least as uh, Italo Calvino Invisible City, that is uh, <laughs> the book that uh, inspired the uh, run. I'm also very happy that we are discussing this book on city and state today because between today and tomorrow, the, in Venice, uh, the architecture exhibition of Biennale will open again. And uh, it was basically closed because of the pandemic last year. So it's, I think it's a very fortunate coincidence that because the, the, the exhibition will be dedicated to uh, the question how 
we will will together and uh, is uh, also metropolis, megalopolis, and uh, and cities in uh, in architecture. Now, in my um, time, uh, I would like to focus on three uh, di dialectic between city, comma, state that I think is the is a, is the uh, I would say the brilliant title of, of the book. Uh, uh, one is a city against the state. The second is a city and the state. And the third one and last one is the city beyond the state. Now for city against the state, I think it's, uh, uh, it's something that in Rand's book is uh, well highlighted. And uh, it's also very interesting how he uh, focused uh, how many times uh, the political entity of city can uh, enter into conflict uh, with the political entity of state. I mean, we're full of, uh, of example. Uh, even during the pandemic, we have uh, these uh, cases of city cities uh, trying to uh, claim against state decision or try to uh, have uh, a, a bigger role in, in facing the pandemic. When I mean, in my view, the pandemic is, is, is of course a problem that should be addressed globally. But uh, this gives you uh, the idea of uh, how this tension between the political entities of, of, of cities, especially when you have to deal with the mega, mega city, as Ran highlighted, think in the case of uh, civil rights or uh, in the case of uh, how to localize a specific plants or in, uh, for the green transition. I mean, you might have a different position from the state uh, on the one hand and the cities on the other end. The, the second dialectic is city and the state. And I think this is probably uh, the most uh, uh, peaceful, but also the most interesting in Rand's book because uh, he uh, brings to the fore the need for states to update or to uh, take into account in their constitution or in a, in a more uh, structured way, the role of cities. So cities as lawmakers, city as uh, uh, actors that should be recognized in the, at the national level. So there are plenty of examples, uh, like, for, I mean, for, for us in Italy, the example of Tokyo is very interesting because at the end of this dual uh, nature of uh, uh, being uh, representative of the national government on the one hand and be a local entity on the other hand, on the other hand is something that we experience in centuries, but it gives you the idea of how cities uh, can be part of uh, the state. The third and last dialectic is the city beyond the state. And here it's also uh, very interesting how Rand's book underline the, the contradiction, not that on the one hand, you have cities uh, playing, uh, and also Marta just recognized how European Union uh, pushes on that. So you have cities uh, acting at international level. Uh, I mean, runs probably expect this from me, but you have the example of the of sports with International Olympic Committee and with the Olympic Games where cities are the uh, main characters of, uh, of the picture. Uh, but on the other hand, you have states even forbidding uh, cities to take part at the international level. So there is this uh, uh, fear of losing power and uh, uh, having uh, uh, a, a minor role from the state uh, uh, insofar as uh, cities uh, have been recognized or are recognized uh, as a political entity at the, at the global level or beyond the state. So, I mean, I think that these three dimensions, of course, there could be more uh, city against the state, city and the state, and city beyond the state, uh, gives uh, an idea to the people, I hope very few people who have not read yet the, the book. Uh, by the way, this book for the people who have not uh, seen it yet from our participants. And also, I think it's something very, uh, encouraging to understand what we are experiencing now. Uh, my final word is really, I mean, uh, this, this is a, a kind of book that every scholar probably 
would dream to write. I mean, in terms of having so many data, so many uh, insights, uh, picking from different uh, legal uh, scholarship and from different social sciences. So my final word is that as a co-president of ICONS and also on behalf of Ross Dixon, my uh, co colleague and uh, the other co-presidents, uh, we are proud uh, to, to, to have the chance to discuss books like this because they really incorporate and represent uh, the spirit of Icon S. I mean, this is probably easy uh, having been run one of the co-president and the founder of Icon S. So, but I think it really makes us happy in seeing uh, also, and I take the chance to say thank you to all the panelists, uh, to how many different perspectives and views were, were brought to the fore. And this is why basically Icon S was born. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for highlighting these three different dimensions between city and state that we can find in the book. And now, finally, we have Ran Hirsch, the author of the book. He is professor of political science and law at the University of Toronto, who will comment um, on his own book. So please, Ran, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Anna, and really my uh, deep gratitude to Icones and to the organizers of uh, the, the live sessions over the last year, and my, in particular, to the five um, uh, sets of really excellent comments and for taking the time to engage with the book that, um, as much as it is relatively easy to engage with it because there's so much in it, it may even be um, a challenge uh, because, because there is so much in it. So uh, I, I, I am deeply grateful for each one of the five commentators for really taking the time and so forth. So creatively coming up with uh, a sets of uh, a sets of comments and suggestions that um, might push the, the discussion forward. Um, obviously, there is no way I can address uh, all the comments in 10 minutes, and I don't think this is even the intent of the of the event. It's more to raise awareness and to and to um, you know make people want to engage with the topic. And 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 on that note, let me say that what we've just witnessed the last hour is to me as the author of this book a dream come true, because when I sat down to write this book, um, I thought, come on, it's just impossible that the majority and as as as, as mentioned in the book and in the commentators the vast majority in the next century of the world lives in cities there is virtually no comparative work that that addresses the one of the most fundamental challenges uh, namely urban agglomeration urbanization mega cities etc that the world um, is going to face humanity is going to face in the coming decades and centuries to come. So it just struck me as, 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 as a major gap. So I think my approach when, when, starting to, when I started to work on this book um, was to treat the book more as a sort of invitation for distinguished scholars of public law in all its varieties and for social scientists who are interested in public law, an invitation for them to begin to think creatively beyond the established dogmas and boundaries of the spatial imagination of constitutional law. Um, if you think about it, if you step back and think about it, the vast majority of literature that addresses the spatial dimensions of constitutional governance is still subject to ideas like central government and subnational units that doesn't take this idea of urbanization or indeed other spatial dimensions like the urban rural divide um, too seriously. Most constitutions don't even take it, don't even address it at all. Um, so I wrote the book as a kind of open invitation for scholars to engage with um, this subject and begin to think creatively about it. And the five sets of comments, and indeed the very fact that we are having this panel is something that uh, up until last year was a wild 
option that we have an icon s panel from scholars from four corners of the world devoted exclusively to thinking creatively together about the issue of uh, mega cities and urbanization and global south and all these things so 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 mission accomplished and and from now on we can debate the details but as the author of this book this is more than i could have asked for and uh, precisely what i had hoped would happen all right so now on the on on uh, some other dimensions i think an issue that for me was very important in writing this book was the the global south uh, element and i i deeply appreciate i i really appreciate the comments on the eu and i think uh, Marcia is correct in saying that uh, it doesn't get uh, excellent press in this book and it probably deserves better treatment and I accept it. And with the flags behind Lorenzo there, I probably should uh, accept authority and, um, and, and do that. But, but to me, um, um, I thought this entire area, uh, area of urban governance and the constitutional status of cities is one of the few areas where innovation emanates almost exclusively, maybe not exclusively, but predominantly from the global South. And so it's one of the few when we, you know, we always debate the boundaries of the constitutional canon and global constitutionalism and all these phrases that actually conceal the fact that the vast majority of concepts and practices and ideas emanate from the global north and it's always you know as i called it in earlier books you know the usual suspect us canada germany um, you know etc here we have an area that is not only overlooked by by public law scholarship in general and constitutional law in particular but also comes mainly from the global south and in the main attempts to actually begin to grapple with some of the issues that Vicky and, and Bianca and Margie and uh, Menaka and Lorenzo raised are global South constitutions, like the Indian constitution, the Brazil constitution of, of, of 88 that does, that really does a miracle, even if it's not successful, which is trying to, for the first time in constitutional, modern constitutional history, to constitutionalize Henri Lefebvre's right to the city that is well known to political philosophers and soci critical sociologists, but virtually unknown to constitutional scholars. And the Constitution of Brazil tries to do this, maybe not perfectly, but at least it tries to grapple with the concept. And the con new Constitution of South Africa is the closest we get to uh, addressing concretely in terms of constitutional design and constitutional jurisprudence some of the issues that Vicky, for example, raised that I fully endorse, you know, the idea I want to treat, um, I, I would like to think in, in the way I begin to envision the practicalities, you know, how to turn this idea into a jurisdictional boundary reality and urban courts, as Bianca mentioned, and all, all these things, um, I, I, I would like to think of the state and the national constitution as a floor. And, and I'm not talking here about secession. I'm not advocating cities going wrong and stuff like that. I am advocating a concept for a concept that treats cities as a, an order of government that gets constitutional recognition in the same way that other orders of government uh, are represented in, and then we can think about the details of what it, my, my um, um, inclination is to treat the national constitution as a floor and then, and then to address the possibility that some of you raised that cities fall in the hands of conservatives or non-liberal um, uh, regimes or, 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 you know, mayors, etc. by um, in the same way as we speak about, say, margin of appreciation or community standards or concept, existing concepts, even subsidiarity is up to a point. It's not a, an exclusive, an exclusive, you know, a sort of open-ended carte blanche to do as you wish. It's, it's up to a point. And, and um, I also think that 
that the, an important dimension here that is missing from the discussion is the idea that you know all the all the existing constitutional arrangements that do not take cities into account miss the kind of bargaining in the shadow of the law idea. So it's okay to, to bargain and all and to treat cities fairly and with goodwill and all these things. But if it's not in the law, if not if it's not in the constitution, then the entire bargaining in the shadow of the law dimension has a significant influence on the outcome because it's not really open bargaining. It's not really all those neutral terms of intergovernmental um, uh, affairs and stuff like that, 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 that comes across to me as uh, free of power relations. Um, ideally, the South African constitution is, the, as, a, as I mentioned before, the closest we get to solving some of these issues as it includes a full chapter, 14 provisions, chapter seven, provisions 151 to 164 that try to address all these issues, including giving cities uh, control over uh, planning, uh, land designation, uh, public housing, and things of that nature. And the South African Constitutional Court has uh, endorsed rather generously this new matrix. Um, let me also try to address in the time I've left a couple of other comments and um, suggestions the significance of the local. If there is something that we've all witnessed over the last year and a half of this crazy pandemic, and some of the early sets of comments addressed the pandemic, is how significant the local is to delivering services, to witnessing life in all its you know, limited, um, confined uh, realities over the last 15 months or so. Um, it goes, goes, you know, anywhere from you can't leave your home or, or you know, can't go more than 500 meters or 1,000 meters away from your home to lockdowns on cities to even some um, federal countries um, erecting or resurrecting boundaries among provinces and states and, and things like that, so uh, which happened pretty much everywhere even in my home country of, of Canada. So, so um, the significance of the local is absolutely critical and it strikes me as uh, supports the general argument of the book that everything said and done, uh, democracy has its origins from the every serious bottom up understanding of democracy must take the local more seriously than than, than you know, universal constitutional thought or constitutional theory has taken it over the last uh, century. Let me quickly say something about density. Vicky raised a critical point here. And, and when I wrote the book, I was struck by the involuntary, extremely high density in all those very poor neighborhoods within cities. And, and um, I think that an, a, a, at least from, from my standpoint as an author, one of the innovative elements of the book is the idea that perhaps density, the concept of density, which is virtually non-existent, not only in constitutional theory, but even in, in political theory is something that is often overlooked, is, is a gold mine for creative thinkers of constitutional and, and political theory. And I accept Vicky's cor corrective, the idea that the idea that extremely low density, let's call the rural urban divide, let's phrase it in that concept, may suggest that density is an important or critical new factor or dimension of diversity. We often talk diversity as in race, ethnicity, gender, etc. But it may well be in sexual preference, but it may well be that the density factor connects the spatial element of, um, of constitutional design with the diversity element. And the, the density element itself is a form of or an axis of diversity that we need to think creatively about. And what I tried to do in the book, but there wasn't enough space to do it because I was limited to 100,000 words and you know the realities of publishing, is to develop further 
all sorts of creative that Vicky touched upon, creative electoral design, um, electoral design mechanisms that might help us mitigate the urban rural divide. And, and, and we can think about, you know, mixed um, districts and, um, and, um, and um, you know, the, the city-based districts and rural districts, and then a compensatory bunch of seats, as is the case in some Scandinavian countries, and to some extent in Germany, and, and so on. So clearly, Vicky and others are correct in saying that the urban-rural divide is, a, is, a, is an important axis here, and we need to begin to think creatively about it. One more thing I'll say about it. Just think about how much literature, all wonderful, over the last five years, dealt with the rise of populism and illiberalism and, and, and you know, all this Hungary and Poland and Turkey and Brazil and India. And it's all great. How many articles can you, can you name, can you identify? I, I, it's an open question to the audience that take the urban rural divide that is so evident in all of this um, that take it seriously from a constitutional standpoint and begin to think creatively about constitutional design ways of, 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 of at least mitigating the tension. One more thing, Vicky raised an important point and I think it was echoed in Marche and, and Bianca's um, comments and, and Lorenzo as well. Um, uh, is it about constitutional design or is it exclusively about constitutional design? Of course not. I view, I view, um, um, you know, we can argue empowerment slash emancipation as uh, Marche um, wisely um, identified. And, and, and I'm not sure I have a clear answer to this. It's a, it's a very good point, um, you know, but, but ultimately, we need to think creatively about um, about these issues and um, shake up our understanding of uh, all those, I don't want to say old because they're very relevant, but you know, take equalization even. You know, the concept that there is this inter-regional or inter-provincial or inter-state transfers from the have, say, provinces or states to the have not. This is well-established principle in many constitutions. Can we begin to shake it up a bit? Can we begin to think that the rural urban is the issue here? Can we begin to think about intra-metropolis pockets of poverty and perhaps, God forbid, think the rich is not gonna, the rich are not gonna like it, but begin to think about intra-metropolis equalization mechanisms in addition to the you know, uh, inter-provincial or interstate ones. I think uh, my time is up and I really want to, and there's lots on the table and I really want to allow other people to come in. So let me conclude by endorsing Lorenzo's three axis of, um, of um, you know, challenges, cities versus states, cities with states and cities beyond the state. And I think it's a very fruitful, um, matrix through which uh, we should um, continue to think about these issues and to suggest that um, invisible cities indeed as um, I, I say in the book the the um, the name of this really tremendous novel of Italian uh, author Italo Calvino captures perhaps in the best possible way my um, agenda as a comparativist and my agenda in particular in writing this book. And finally to Anna, I really hope this is not my last book. I really hope it's the most recent one. And um, I for one absolutely intend to write more and, and, and sessions like this one provide great encouragement, not only for me, but I hope for other people. If you see a gap, if you see a lacuna, if you see something that absolutely needs some new ideas, go for it. Uh, it's absolutely possible to do. So uh, thanks again for all these wonderful comments and I will respond individually to all five commentators, but there's only that much I can do 